Welcome everyone to this National Forum Seminar. My name is Crystal Fulton and with my colleagues Emma O'Neill and Carmel Hensey, we'd like to welcome you to our National Forum Seminar today entitled Fostering Metacognition in the Digital Learning Environment. We have an action packed three hours ahead of us this afternoon, including a keynote by Professor Sandra McGuire, an overview of our teaching and academic fellowship research project exploring the potential for metacognitive learning in the virtual learning environment or VLE. Now, before we go any further, we'd like to thank the National Forum for funding this seminar today. We also thank University College Dublin and UCD Teaching and Learning for their support of our fellowship research. We have organized with Design to Learn or D2L for short, to bring you a bespoke learning space in bright space that you can now use and right now and for 10 days after this seminar. Please do register for the Brightspace community to access this material as per the email we have sent to you. Please note that there can be a delay in activation of your community request of up to an hour. So please feel free to take a moment now and sign up if you haven't already, and then hopefully that'll be ready to go for you shortly. Um, we hope you'll enjoy this space where you will find all kinds of resources to learn more about metacognition and how you might apply what you're learning today in your own teaching. By the way, for everyone who engages with this space, we're holding a draw for copies of Sondra McGuire's book. Details about this may be found in our Brightspace community area. So thank you very much. And now to our keynote. We have the great pleasure today to welcome Professor Sandra McGuire as our keynote speaker. Sandra is internationally known for her work on metacognition. She has published widely on this subject, including her books, Teach Students How to Learn and Teach Yourself How to Learn. Sandra is the Director Emerita of the Center for Academic Success and retired Assistant Vice Chancellor and Professor of Chemistry at Louisiana State University. Her keynote today is entitled, Teach Students How to Learn, Metacognition is the Key. We know you are as excited as we are to hear Sandra's talk. Welcome, Sandra. Thank you so much. It's really exciting uh, for me to be here. And uh, I want to welcome everybody also. I'm going to share my screen. OK, yes. And so I am going to be talking about teaching students how to learn. And I say metacognition is the key. And this, this whole um, session is about metacognition and in the, using it, especially in the digital age. And uh, I can tell you that uh, the idea of talking about metacognition, and this is the, the uh, title of the book is Teach Students How to Learn. Uh, but the idea of teaching students how to learn, uh, the first time I heard that phrase was probably in the mid to late 80s. And when I first heard that term, it was the most nonsensical phrase on the planet to, uh, to me. Teach students how to learn. How are you going to do that? If students don't know how to learn and you teach them how to learn, they're not going to learn it because they don't know how to learn. And so it just seemed nonsensical to me, but now I know that that means that we can teach students that learning is a process and we can teach them what the steps are in that process. And uh, here's the, the book. And most of the things that we're gonna be talking about today are from the uh, ideas and concepts in the book. And I really wanna thank uh, Crystal, Emma and Carmo for inviting me to, to do this because uh, metacognition in the digital learning environment is uh, it, it might be a little bit more challenging. Well, a digital learning environment, I think some students find it more challenging. And I think it's especially important for them to have metacognitive skills to be able to use those when they're in the digital environment. And I first became aware of Crystal, Emma and colleagues uh, when I happened to attend the D2L session and uh, they were talking about this and lo and behold, I tuned in and I saw my book that they were using with students and, and I've been following their work. And uh, just to kind of give you a, a preview, I guess, of, of what this can do, some of the key findings from the work that they uh, did. And it was um, among different disciplines, uh, a group of veterinary school students, some communication students, et cetera. And what they found, which was very consistent with what I've seen over the years and what colleagues have seen, is that many times students don't think they need this information uh, at first, but their students changed their attitudes when they learned about metacognition and wrote reflections, which are really important. We'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. 
uh, they were initially re reticent about group work, which we find all the time because so many students have found when they were in secondary school, group work didn't work well for them because they were the only serious person in the group. And so they found it a waste of time. But when they learn these metacognitive strategies, it makes sense to them that group work is going to be uh, important. The results from the metacognitive awareness inventory showed that students had they improved in both metacognitive knowledge and skills, and that's very important. And they used goal setting, self monitoring, and evaluating their learning from the perspective now of improvements that could be made, as opposed to uh, many times students think of evaluations as a judgment on their learning. They get a test back, they look at the score, they tuck it away, never look at it again. But now these students are seeing that this information can be used to uh, improve. And then finally, reflection and self-monitoring are key ingredients to helping students implement metacognitive strategies and also providing rubrics so that students can self-monitor is really, really crucial. And so again, I thank my colleagues for inviting me to join you this morning. And, and uh, oh, let me just say that I asked a lot of questions. And so let me get the chat box up. And so most of these questions, I'm going to ask you to respond in the chat box. And we have a few polls also. And this is the first poll. So uh, Crystal, if you could get the first poll up, please. And so I always like to ask my audiences because I want to see if uh, you know a lot about metacognition, just a little bit more than you want to know. Um, okay. Uh, and you will see, okay, that um, uh, most of us know either nothing or uh, a moderate amount. Um, and there's only one person who said uh, more than I, I want to know. Uh, sometimes people say that it's a mistake. And then some people say, well, you know, I'm metacognition, schmetacognition. I'm sick of hearing about this. And so uh, if that was your, uh, your uh, attitude about metacognition, you are not alone. When I first heard the word, it sound like, sounded like a fancy word, education niece, and like, you know, what does this have to do with anything? And so hopefully by the end of this, uh, I will have convinced you that it's okay to know more about uh, metacognition. All right, so thank you very much for participating in the poll. And so now what I wanna do is define metacognition the way I define it for students. Um, because, and there are a lot of uh, fancier terms, there's a, a lot of different components to metacognition, but I find that when I'm talking with students, I really want them to understand this at an intuitive level. So I use the simplest definition and I say, it's your ability to think about your own thinking. And I say, it's kind of like you had a big brain outside your brain looking at what your brain is doing. And that big brain is asking your brain questions. And it's saying, does she really understand this information or did she just memorize it last night because the test is today? It's your ability to be consciously aware that you are a problem solver. So that when things come up, that you have a question about or a problem with, then you can figure out ways to answer those questions. You don't have to get somebody else to answer all of your questions. You can take steps to answer some of the questions that you come up with. And an example that I like to use for faculty is, and here's a question for the chat box. I'm gonna ask you to put it in the chat box. If we think about it, most of the questions that students ask us about our courses how the course is gonna be operated, when the first test is gonna be, what's gonna be on there. Where could they find that information? Please put in the chat box, please. The questions that students come up and ask us about the course, uh, many times they have something that would allow them to answer the question that they have come up with. And so my question to you is, where could students find much of the information that they ask you? Exams in a set, okay, course description, course outline. Yes, this is great. Module handbook, bright space, absolutely. And uh, so, yeah, so the, the fact of the matter is if they really thought about it, then they could answer those questions. And so um, it's almost like if a student comes up with, if the brain comes up with, well, I wonder when the next test is gonna be, I gotta go ask the instructor. But the metacognitive brain says, no, wait a minute, we can answer that question. And so then the brain says, well, what am I supposed to do? And then the metacognitive brain says, well, what resources did our instructor give us that might have that information? And so it leads them to Brightspace or the course description or VLA, uh, VLE, all the things that they have in their possession that would answer those questions. And it's like the brain goes, oh yeah, I see what you mean. I guess I don't have to contact the instructor. 
And it's also your ability to plan, monitor, and control your mental processing. So you know if you're understanding something or if you're just memorizing it. It's your ability to accurately judge your level of learning. So you know if you are studying at too low a level or if you are at an appropriate level for the course. And I'll give you an example of that. And let me just ask if you've ever experienced this where you have, uh, you're giving exams back and a student who has not done very well looks and sees they have a low score and they say, oh, I don't know why I didn't do better. I studied and studied and studied for that exam. I just put a yes or no in the chat box, please, if you've ever had that happen to you. Um, okay, so I'm seeing, okay, yes, indeed, yes, okay. Now, typically those students are not lying. They have spent hours and hours studying for that test. But my next question is, what kinds of activities were those students involved in when they were spending hours and hours studying for the test? What were they doing? What kinds of things were they doing? Exactly, reading and highlighting, rereading, memorizing, note learning, wrote, absolutely, yes. And they would have done fine, let's say if it had been a, a psychology course, and if the question were define positive reinforcement, define negative reinforcement, define punishment, they would have been fine with that. But those aren't the kinds of questions that we ask they would be able to answer those questions that are based on rote memorization, but those aren't the kinds of questions we ask. We ask questions, we wanna give them a scenario and ask in this particular situation, is positive reinforcement, negative reinforcement or punishment better this, uh, and define, or I'm sorry, defend your choice. But they don't know how to do that because all they've done is memorize. And so this comes, uh, I think they're being able to accurately judge their level of learning is very related to Bloom's taxonomy. So please put in the chat box, yes or no, if you'd say you are very familiar with Bloom's taxonomy, B-L-O-O-M-S. Okay, I am not surprised because as instructors, we are pretty much very familiar with Bloom's. Okay, now here's the next question. And I did see a no, and so don't um, be concerned because I'm gonna talk about the way I discuss it with Bloom's. But since most of us are, my next question is, have you ever consciously taught students, maybe spent at least part of a class session teaching students specifically about Bloom's taxonomy? Give me a yes or no, um, where you've gone over the levels and you, okay, I'm seeing lots of, of yeses and I'm seeing some no's some, sometimes. Okay, yes. Well, I'm going to urge all of us to actively teach Bloom's taxonomy to our students. Now, I totally understand those of us who were not uh, are not teaching Bloom's to students because I never did before I got to LSU. And I learned Bloom's uh, as a graduate student because my PhD is actually in chemical education. But when I learned Bloom's taxonomy, it was uh, I learned it as a construct for us as faculty to use to target our instruction, to target our assessment. And I never taught it to students. But when I got to LSU, they were teaching it to students very successfully. And so I started teaching it to students. And the number one reaction I would get from students is they'd say, wow, I wish somebody had told me about this earlier. Why didn't somebody teach me about this in high school? This is so helpful. Because I think that Bloom's taxonomy is the lens through which they have to view our statements when we say, this is college now, you're in vet school, you're in med school, you've got to kick it up a notch. And I always ask students when I talk with them, have you ever heard a professor say something like that? And they say, yeah, we have all the time. And when I ask students, what do you think those professors mean when they make that statement? Uh, very few hands go up. Uh, and the ones who say something say, well, I think that means that college is gonna be harder than secondary school. Uh, we, we have to do more work here. And then when I ask, have you ever heard of Bloom's taxonomy? Almost nobody has. But then when I explain it to them, it's like the light bulbs go on and they see what those statements mean. And so I'll show in a little bit how uh, we explain Bloom's taxonomy to students and your ability to know what you know, what you don't know. So you don't show up at a test or a quiz thinking, okay, I know this stuff, I'm good, I studied it. And then you look at the first two questions like, uh-oh, I guess I don't really know it. And so if you're using metacognition, then you can do all of these things. And this is the way I explain it to students so that they understand exactly we're talking about they are taking control of their learning. So then they can really be self-directed uh, independent learners. 
Now, why haven't a lot of students developed these skills? Well, I think for many students, it just wasn't necessary before they got to the level that we are at now. And so what that means is that we as faculty have to help students make that transition to uh, college, to the university, to med school, to grad school, to vet school. And so we've got to help them identify the gap between their current behavior that's leading to their current level of learning and lack of the grades that they want and they're able to achieve to the productive behavior that's gonna result in the desired learning and the grades that they are capable of and that they want. And so I'm going to talk about specific strategies that I'm gonna introduce you to uh, so that you can start teaching these to your students immediately. And I'm gonna do this by way of introducing you to students. And so this is Dana, who was a first year physics student. And I met her when she was about to drop out of physics as a major. And this is what we find with so many students who have done well uh, at the secondary level. But then when they get to college, if they're not doing as well as they did uh, before, then they get very discouraged. They think they need to change their majors. And um, this is what was happening to Dana after she made the 54, she decided that physics was just not for her. And so I want you to hear about Dana's experience in her own words. And I'm going to let you know that she starts off very softly. And so what you'll have to do is turn your volume all the way up. So I'll start speaking a little bit softer so that I won't blow your speakers out because I tend to speak very loud. And so listen very carefully, but she does, she does get louder as it goes along. So uh, hopefully you'll be able to hear her with no problem. Hi, my name is Dana Lewis Derby, and I am a former student of Dr. McGuire's, and she asked for me to share a little bit of my story with you today. Um, so I met Dr. McGee um, at a Find Your Major workshop at LSU when I was a freshman. I knew that I wanted to major in physics when I started college, but I quickly found myself failing my introduction to physics class. So I freaked out and thought, you know what, maybe I'm not cut out for this and decided to attend that workshop. When I went there, I shared my story and afterwards Dr. McGuire approached me and asked me if I would consider sticking with physics a little while longer and maybe trying to approach my assignments and my tests uh, in a little bit of a different way. So instead of changing my major, I did. I stayed with physics. Her and I began working together and she began teaching me some of her strategies revolving around metacognition. I quickly learned that my method of trying to memorize material in order to pass assignments and tests just was not going to cut it. Um, I had to really learn the ability to problem solve and I essentially had to relearn how to study. I was reading chapters differently, making notes, and essentially completing homework assignments like I had to teach the material to someone else. With the thought behind that being, if you can teach it, uh, then you really do know what you're talking about. After working with Dr. McGuire for a full semester, um, I ended up making an A in my physics course, and I went on to graduate with uh, my bachelor's in physics from LSU with honors, all with Dr. McGuire's help. Um, so I didn't quite know that going to one workshop was going to be so instrumental in setting me up for success throughout my entire college career. My life would be very, very different if I had not met uh, Dr. McGuire that day and implemented the strategies that she taught me. Um, she is absolutely phenomenal and she really does have the golden ticket of information that's going to push you towards optimal success. So I hope that you um, enjoy the workshop today. Thanks for listening and best of luck. Bye. Okay, yes, and I'd like for people to hear Dana in her own words. One thing she said was, uh, she, she said that we worked the whole semester, which is true, but I only spent one session talking with her about learning strategies. And this is one of the things I love about this, that it really is a paradigm shift that we can effect in students when we talk about these strategies and help them see exactly what they were doing that wasn't productive and what they need to be doing to be more productive. 
And so what I found was that many, many students, uh, especially in, in the sciences, but in all disciplines, uh, one of the reasons, ah, here's a question for the chat box, because maybe you haven't experienced this, um, but put a yes or no if you've ever experienced where uh, you have students who are doing very well on the homework. They are getting almost perfect marks on the homework, but then they don't do well at all on the test. So give me a yes or no if you've ever seen that phenomenon. Okay, yes, uh, and, and we see it all the time. And it was actually when I taught at Cornell University that I discovered the problem. Uh, most of the things we're talking about today, I did not know before I got to LSU, but this one thing I did learn at Cornell, it's that most people are doing their homework incorrectly. And so um, when, I, actually, let me ask you to think back to the last time you were doing homework and uh, just put a yes or a no in the chat box. Uh, if you ever did this, if you ever looked at a problem you had to solve or a question you had to answer and flip back in the chapter to find an example of the problem you had to work or discussion of the question that you had to answer, they all say yes. And I tell them, you know, I did the same thing, unfortunately, because I didn't know that you weren't supposed to do that. But then I asked them, when we did that, were we working the problem? Was our brain working the problem? And they'll say no. Now ask, well, what was working the problem? They'll say, well, the textbook or the author, sometimes they'll say the example. I said, yes. And I say, and I know you are really, really capable students. I was a very capable student. How many of you remember thinking when you looked at the way the example was worked, thinking, oh yeah, I got that. Oh yeah, I understand that. And they all say, yeah. And they said, yeah, but when we got to the test or the quiz, if they changed anything at all around, what happened? And one young man one time said, oh, I realized I don't got that. And so this homework strategy is one that is very effective. We teach them that before they look at the first problem, they've got to study the material first, study it as if it's going to be on a test or a quiz the very next day. And when they do that, they're going to get to either example problems, or if it's a social sciences book, there might be these little thought questions, you know, why do you think this might happen? And so when I ask students, what do you do if you're using either your textbook or your notes? What do you do when you get to an example? And I'm going to ask you to put in the chat box what you think students told me they do, or what do you think students do when they're reading their textbook and they get to an example, or if they get to one of these little thought questions? Because I can tell you their response surprised me. But what do you think students do when they get to that? Yep, you are better than I am. You're exactly right. They told me they skipped it. Well, I was surprised because, okay, some might skip it. I'll try to figure it out. Now, nobody told me they tried to figure it out. Most of them said they skip it. Sometimes they'll say, well, they'll read the statement and then they'll look at what the author did, which is what I used to do. But then I say, I don't want you to do either one of those. What I want you to do, study the material first. And then when you get to those example problems or questions, then work it yourself without looking at what the author did. Just read the problem statement, work it yourself until you get to an answer. Then compare just your answer with the answer that's in the book. If you got the same answer, then you can look at what the author did. But if you didn't get the same answer, don't look yet. Try to figure out where your mistake was. And then I'll ask students, at this point in the process, do you think making a mistake is good or bad? And I want you to put in the chat box for me what you think students say. Do, do students say, at this point in the process, making a mistake is good or bad? What do you think students say? Okay, most of you are like your colleagues here, but I, more of you are saying good than my audiences uh, in the US. Um, and those of you who said good are absolutely right. Students always say good. And, but faculty typically say students say bad, but when students say good, I say, absolutely, you're right. It's good if you make a mistake at this point. I said, but now don't get me wrong. I'm not saying it's bad if you don't make a mistake at this point. It's excellent if you don't make a mistake at this point. It's great. But why is it good if you make a mistake at this point? And they are so dead on. Put in the chat box what you think students say. Some of the reasons that students say it's good if you make a mistake at this point. And there are three common answers I get from students. And I'm going to see if... You're, yes, they say you learn from your mistakes. Yes, and also low stakes. They say it's not the test yet. Uh, absolutely, they're learning. And then the third thing they say is, now I know where my brain is having a tendency to go wrong. Sometimes they'll say, so I'm not going to make the same mistake twice. So they're absolutely right. And, um, and so they get it now. But now 
most of them before, yep, understanding what strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats, absolutely. And so now they get it. Why just looking, just skipping over the examples is actually detrimental to their learning. And so then I say, you know, check to see if it's correct. If it's not, figure out where the mistake was. And that's just the example. I tell, oh, actually, I want to go back to no stakes. Let me go back to that one a, a bit. Because when they say it's not the test, I say, you know, absolutely. And then I, let me ask you this. Have you ever had a student, when you give them a test back, they look at it and they, they see the mistakes they made and they said, oh, I would have done so much better, but I just made so many simple mistakes. I just made so many just careless mistakes. Have you ever heard a student say something like that? Oh, okay, yes. So I will ask students, how many of you have ever gotten a test back and looked at it and you said, oh, I would have done so much better if I hadn't made these simple mistakes. And they all say, yeah. And I said, look, my attitude is that there's really no such thing as simple mistakes. Mistakes only look simple in retrospect. Once you know what the right thing is, your mistake looks so simple, but mistakes are things that have to be made. And either you're gonna make them during this process or where are you gonna make them? And so I'll ask you this to answer. Uh, if you don't make the mistakes during this process, where are you likely to make those mistakes? Okay, exactly. In the, in the final exam, on the test, in life, exactly. And so this is what students will say. Typically they'll say on the test. And so the beauty of this is, and, and the, um, I guess the effectiveness is the pro of the process is I'm not telling them you need to be doing this or you're going to screw up on the test. They're telling me. And I say, where, where are you going to mess up if you don't make the mistakes now? Then they tell me on the test or with the patients or in life. And so when we ask students the questions that allow them to think of the answers and give us the information that we would have told them, then it is much more likely to stick with them because now they've come up with the information. And so, and that's just the examples. I tell them when you get to the actual homework problems, then treat those as if it's a test or a quiz. Uh, try to speed it up, do them a little bit more quickly because so many students run out of time on a test or a quiz, not because they can't answer the questions, but because they've never, uh, they've never tried to speed things up because you can have as much time as you want when you're doing homework. So I want them to practice doing things, answering questions, working problems a little bit more quickly, and it makes a big difference. So that's one strategy that I've found, and I've taught this to vet school students, med school students, undergrads, graduate students, uh, in all kinds of disciplines, and they say that it makes a huge difference. Now, the next strategy I want to share with you is actually a reading strategy uh, that I had uh, at the Learning Center at LSU. There were so many students, including grad school students who were coming to our center saying, you know, I'm, I'm doing the reading, but I'm not getting the most out of it. Can you teach me reading strategies? And this young man, um, his instructor had sent him to me because he'd made a 47 and a 52 on the first two tests. And she wanted him to get in to talk with me earlier, but our students are so busy. I don't know if your students are the same way, uh, but they are working, they're doing all these kinds of things. And so he could never get himself in. So I actually talked to him about 30 minutes the night before the third test. And he made an 82. And I was shocked because I thought he would make in the low to mid 70s. Uh, I figured 20 point bump, 30 minutes the night before the test was what I was expecting, but he made an 82 and he called me immediately and said, Dr. McGuire, I made an 82 on that test. And I said, wow, Travis, that's fantastic. If you make higher than an 85 on your next test, I'll take you to lunch. Now, let me tell you, I did not think that this guy would make higher than an 85 at all, because I thought the 82 was a fluke. And I thought at least statistical regression would kick in and that he would not make higher than an 85, but he made an 86. And so after I verified with the instructor that this self-reported 86 was actually what he made, and she said, yeah, he made an 86. I took him to, to lunch and I said, Travis, what are you doing? And he said, I'm just doing that stuff you told me to do. And with Travis, it was a reading strategy. And it gets at the uh, phenomenon that, in fact, here, you can put yes or no in the chat box for me, please. If you have ever found yourself, you, you start to read, you get a little ways in, and then your mind starts to wander. Uh, give me a yes or no if that uh, ever happens to you. Okay, yeah, I think it happens to everybody, and it happens to students too. And so the and then when your mind starts to wander, if you're like me, 
Um, I don't even realize that I'm not thinking about the, the information because I'm what's called a sub vocalizer. So I can see the words, I can hear them in my brain and I'm thinking about something else. So I don't realize I wasn't paying attention until I'm maybe two or three paragraphs down the road. And so once you realize that, oh, I wasn't paying attention, I don't know what I just read, what do you tend to do at that point? Exactly, yes, you go back and you reread and you might get a little bit further, but you're not gonna get a lot further because you don't have any different strategies. And so these strategies will address those. So the first thing that we have to do is uh, preview the text before reading to give your brain a big picture. We know from the cognitive science literature that whenever the brain is trying to learn something new, if it has a big picture and overview of what it's about to learn and then gets individual details to fill in that big picture, it's much more efficient than if it just starts out getting individual details trying to create its own big picture. And so if we get that big picture, then that's very important. And then after you get the big picture, then come up with questions that you think the reading might answer. Uh, and okay, let's see, Harry says, try focusing. Yes, and sometimes it's hard to focus if you don't have the specific strategies that we're talking about now. So get that big picture, then come up with questions. So for example, if I'm reading a chapter on acids and bases in chemistry, I will see, oh, to do the preview, and you'll see, uh, you focus on the bold face print, the italicized words, any charts or graphs. And um, so if I were reading a chapter on acids and bases, I would see strong acid, weak acid, strong base, weak base in bold face print probably. And so then I would come up with a question, I would say, hmm, I wonder what this thing is gonna say is the difference between strong acids and weak acids. Does one of them burn you more than another? I don't know. Let me see what this, this thing is going to say about it. And so you develop those questions. And then when you start to read, just read the first paragraph and then stop trying to put that information in your own words and then read the second paragraph. Stop, put that information in your own words, trying to fold in what was in the paragraph before and then read subsequent paragraphs the same way. Now, when I talk to students about this, I always stop at this point and I ask, does it sound like if I got to do all that, it's going to take a long time to get through the reading? And just put a yes or no in the chat box to me if it sounds like going through all of that's going to take a long time to get through the reading. Okay, yeah. And uh, it sounds exhausting, <laughs> absolutely. And so, uh, but students love this. Students will come back and they say, Dr. McGuire, that reading strategy is so helpful. And I always ask them, I'll say, do you find that it's taking you longer to get through the reading doing this than what you were doing before? And to a person, they say, well, no, actually, I finished the reading sooner doing this than what I was doing before. So my question to you in the chat box is, why should it take less time to do all of this than what they were doing before? Exactly. You're more focused. They're not rereading. Absolutely. And this is what students tell me. Yeah, and I say absolutely because see the old way you'd read a little bit, then you have to go back, read, go back, read, go back, read, go back, read, go back. But this way, you actually are moving more slowly through the material, but you get to the end sooner because you're not doing all that back and forth, as Mara says, because you've taught your brain what to expect and it's looking for that. They're more focused, they're more attentive, absolutely. And uh, this is just the next sli uh, slide is just a summary of that. It's called SQ5R. Some of you may have heard of SQ3R, but it's up to five now. Do that survey, come up with questions, and then do that reading one paragraph at a time while you're summarizing in your own words. And you can teach them to uh, write, annotate in the margins if there are any key concepts or lingering questions they have. Then the next R is review. When you get to the end of a whole section, stop and summarize that information. And then the last R is for reflect. Are there any other views or remaining questions? And so um, an example of that might be uh, if you were teaching a community nutrition course and uh, the advice was um, in the textbook was tell all of your clients to, that they have to eat a diet that is very rich in fresh fruits and vegetables. Well, suppose you know that your clients live in a food desert. They don't have access to fresh fruits and vegetables. What could you tell them that's gonna be useful to them that they have access to if you can't tell them to do what's in the book because they can't do that. And so when students use this, it makes a, a huge difference. And so I'm going to do a little exercise with you now that shows you the impact of that. And so on the next slide, I'm going to put a passage up. I'm gonna ask you to read it, then I'm gonna take it off and ask you a question about it. So let's read this passage.
Okay, so I think everybody's had a chance now. Okay, so I've, I've taken it off the screen. So my question is, um, if I asked you to unmute your mic and summarize the information that was in that slide to the group, would you be able to do that? Give me a yes or no in the chat box. I said, just unmute your mic and summarize that. Okay, I'm, I'm seeing a no, no thanks, not very well. Okay, and I, I know I certainly could not have. But what if you had known before you started to read that this was about, oh yeah, and Alexandra said, yeah, flying a kite. Yeah, this was about flying a kite. And so I want everybody else to read it and just put in the chat box, yes or no, if it makes more sense to you now that you know that it's about flying a kite. Okay, and I'm seeing some yes. And so I like to do these examples for students that demonstrate to them that if you take the time to do your previewing, then yes, that context that you have is really, really going to help you to understand when you're reading. Absolutely. And here is the reference for that if you want to look it up. And so one of the things I mentioned that reflection questions were super important. And so I'll share with you two of the reflection questions that I asked that really help students to make that connection between why they're not doing well and what they have been doing. And so I asked them, What's the difference if you think there's any difference at all between studying and learning? And in the interest of time, what I'm going to do normally, I would ask you to put in the chat box your answers. But now I'm just going to ask you to think of your answer. And I'm going to tell you the three most common answers I get from students. And I'm going to see if your answers, uh, you can, can uh, evaluate whether your answer is like one of those three. Uh, or if it's different, you know, you can put in the chat box how you would uh, describe the difference. But the three most common answers I get from students, the most common one, they'll say, ah, studying is just memorizing information for a test or a quiz. But learning is when I understand that information, I can apply it, I can relate it to what I already know. Sometimes they'll say studying is short term, learning is long term. And yes, Vicki, sometimes they'll say uh, learning is fun and, and studying is tedious. Um, and, and yes, interiorizing the content. Yes, yeah, so you're making it your own, absolutely. And uh, so then, so, so they're telling me what the difference is and giving these differences. And then when I asked students, I said, yeah, so if we take that as the difference up to this point in time, would you say you've spent more time in study mode or in learn mode? And now put that in the chat box. Do you think most students tell me that they've spent more time once they understand what the distinction is and nobody's ever asked them before typically uh, nobody's ever asked them to to um, make those uh, comparisons absolutely students say study mode and i said yes and so the strategies that we're talking about will allow you to stay in learn mode and then the next question is i asked for well, which task would you work harder if i told you that if uh, oh, I, I see this is an, an, yeah, in school, college, study, and life, work, and learn. Yes. And so I think that that's a great distinction, distinction because I want them to understand that they need to be doing in college what they're going to be doing in life. And so if they work on learning in college, then it's going to be much easier in life. So absolutely. Thanks so much, uh, Adele, for that. Um, so I asked them, for which task would you work harder? Uh, and I set it up more in detail in the book, but in the interest of time, I'll just tell you what the two options are. Uh, yes, would you work harder if I told you that you didn't do so well on the first test, so the second test is coming up, you have to make an A on this test, but the second option is I tell you, uh, well, you know how hard you would work if you had to make an A on the next test. The other option I say is, suppose I told you that the class session before the next test, I'm going to offer a review session to the class, and I'm going to have you come up to the front of the class to conduct this review session. You have to explain all of the concepts, paying particular attention to the more difficult concepts to make sure everybody is prepared for the test. Would you work harder to make an A on the test or if you had to teach the material to the class with no notes and no books? So now continue your voting, please. Okay, and so I'm going to end the poll and show you the results. Um, but 95% uh, of us that teach the material to the class. And when I do this, there are sometimes a few students who say they would work harder to make an A on the test. But when I ask them why, typically they're doing the right thing. They're saying, well, I know I have to understand everything three times as well. So those students are typically okay. Um, but most of them say they would work harder to teach the material. 
And I asked them why would they work harder to teach the material? And so put in the, um, in the chat box for me. Oh yeah, it depends on the test format. So I'm gonna comment on that, but everybody else put in the, in the chat box for me, why would you work harder if you had to teach the material? And uh, Suzanne says it depends on the test format. And I have, okay, peer pressure. I have found that students will say, well, if it's multiple choice, then I just wanna memorize because I'm just, I know I'm just having to recognize the answers. Um, but if it's an essay, then I do something differently. So the three answers that students typically give me, they'll say, well, I gotta really know it if I have to teach it. And faculty sometimes are really surprised by that because uh, they say, well, didn't they know that they really had to know it to make an A on the test? And typically they didn't. And uh, somebody just said, don't wanna look like a fool. Uh, and that's what some students say, I don't wanna look stupid in front of the class. And, uh, and then uh, sometimes they say that, um, yeah, I, I know I've learned it if I can teach it. The other response, and it may have come in, but the chats are going up kind of fast and furiously, so I may have missed it. But the other thing they'll say, the more empathetic students will say, well, I want to make sure I'm teaching it correctly. And so I want to make sure that I understand everything. I can answer questions. And they said, because if I don't teach it correctly and students don't do well on the test, then it's going to be my fault. So now I realize that everybody's performance on the test is dependent upon me. And so they realize that they would work harder if they had to, uh, if they had to teach the material. And so then I asked them, up to this point in time, would you say you've been more in scenario A mode or scenario B mode? Uh, let me put these back and just put uh, A or B in the chat box. Do you think students say up to this point before we have this discussion prior have, yeah, have they been studying to make A's on the test or have they been preparing to teach the material? They all say A, yes. And at this point I say, that's fantastic. I love it when you're doing everything wrong because that means when you start changing things, you're much more likely to see improvement because I never ever wanna make students feel bad about what they've been doing in the past because there was no way for them to know that they were supposed to be doing anything different. So I, I like to turn it into a positive. And um, once when I taught this strategy to a group of students in the chemistry classes, one young man, Ty, came up afterwards and he said he really liked that strategy. He had a beta fish in his room and he was gonna start teaching the material to his beta fish. And then about five weeks later, he showed me the impact. He'd made a 66 on his first bio exam and it went to 98, then 90, he got a B in the class. And then for chemistry, went from 62 to 83 and he ended up with a B in the class. And uh, I asked students now, oh, I, don't, I forgot to, to tell you two things. One is you're gonna get this whole PowerPoint presentation. It's gonna be uh, in the Brightspace and you're gonna get it in PowerPoint form, not PDF. So you can pick and choose any slides that you wanna use with your students and you'll have some other PowerPoint presentations in there also. Um, and I wanna ask you to do what I wish I had started doing uh, when I started teaching, but I didn't do it. It didn't dawn on me to do it until, until after I was at LSU for about three or four years. But everybody in this session has had students who were not doing well and they came to you and they talked with you and you told them something and they started doing a lot better. But if you're like me, you never ask those students to send me an email and tell me exactly what you did differently. And I'm gonna urge you to do that because th what they're doing differently can be part of your repertoire of strategies that you teach students. And it's also very motivational. I'll keep the before and after scores also because it's very motivational if a student comes in and says, oh, woe is me, I made a 70 on the first test, I don't know what to do. You whip out and say, no, here's a student with the names redacted, of course. Here's a student who made a 50 on the first test and made 90 on the next test based on what we're going to talk about in this session. It makes a huge difference because many times when students come to talk with us after they haven't done well, they really don't think we're going to tell them anything that's useful. They're embarrassed to be there and they don't think we're going to be very helpful. So if we start out with, oh, don't worry about that. I've worked with students who've done worse and they ended up doing well then it, it's really, really helpful for those students. And you're teaching them strategies that have been used successfully by other students like them. So at this email, he said, I attended more of the supplemental instruction sessions and exam reviews. And supplemental instruction sessions are more like uh, group reviews that focus on learning strategies. And before he went to some of those sessions, but he didn't go to all of them. 
And he wouldn't do anything before he went to the session. But after learning this information, now he says before the uh, exam and review sessions, I would try to answer as many of the questions as possible to see about where I was in terms of grasping the information. Then at those sessions, I would know what I needed to understand. Then after the review uh, SI sessions, I would go back to my room and teach the materials to my beta fish. The material I couldn't explain, I'd study more. I continued that cycle until I could explain everything in my notes. And that's really, really a useful thing to do. And um, we mentioned uh, study groups earlier. They tell students one of the huge benefits of study groups is you can practice teaching the information, explaining it to each other. And if you are not comfortable with something or if somebody hears you say something that is not exactly right, then you can, can discuss that information. So this also helps students understand the importance and the utility of study groups. And um, I was uh, talking with a group of students at another university, uh, Howard University in Washington, DC. And before I got back on the plane to come back to Baton Rouge, the students had texted me, one of the students texted me this picture, look what you inspired. They had gone out and bought their own beta fish. And so now I tell students, no, 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 you don't have to go out and buy your own pet. If you have empty chairs in your room, if you have stuffed animals, if you have imaginary friends, if you have any audience, either real or imagined, that you can pretend you're teaching the information to, then it makes all the difference in the world because when you get stuck, that's your key that you don't totally understand this and you can go back and study it. And I thought about this, uh, this fish, beta fish in March of this year, because it was a couple of years. Uh, and I wondered, if, was he still alive? Had he been flushed down somebody's toilet? Um, but uh, they, I, so I texted this young lady to find out what happened to him and he's still alive. They named him Sully and he's living with one of the students, Michaela. And so, oh, and there was a vet school student who was flunking animal physiology and she ended up making an A in the class. And I asked her, well, what did you do? And she said, Dr. McGuire, I have the smartest dog in animal physiology on the planet. She said, every day after class, I would go and I would teach him what we had learned that day. And that's how she turned everything around. And so now the next little activity I wanna do with you is going to show why it is that I tell students, I'm so confident that even if you made a 45 on the first test, you can make 90 or higher on the next test um, because it's really all about the strategies and teaching them to engage their brain. And I want students to know that if you haven't been doing well, it's not because you're not smart, it's because you were using the wrong strategies. And so this little exercise that I'm gonna do will demonstrate that. Now on the next slide, there are gonna be a lot of bunch of numbers all jumbled up. And I want you to, I'm gonna give you 15 seconds to first locate the number one and then locate the number two, locate them in sequence. Don't look at any numbers that you haven't found in sequential order. Uh, and so then I'm, and when, after 15 seconds are up, I'm gonna ask you to put in the chat box, how many you found in sequential order. So let's start finding the numbers now. And stop. Okay, and so what's the highest number you got up to finding them in sequential order, put that in the chat box. Okay, three, four, two, seven, five, yep, six. Okay, yeah, I usually get single digits or very low double digits, okay? And so now I want you to look at it again and see this vertical line, this horizontal line and the position of the number one. And I'm gonna ask you, what do you notice about how the other numbers are positioned? Um, what do you see about how they're arranged? And so, because they're arranged according to something. So put that in the chat box for me, please. What a, exactly clockwise or quadrants. Yeah, actually, yeah, clockwise. So anti, anti-clockwise, uh, Harry. Uh, but yeah, clockwise. And so now, because the one is here, the two is there, the three is there, the four is there. And that's interesting. Students these days very rarely say clockwise because um, they can't read analog clocks. They're so used to digital clocks. So usually they'll say quadrants. And I said, yes, yeah, fine. Okay, so now that we know how they are arranged, I'm going to give you another 15 seconds and ask you start back at number one and now find as many as you can find. And then when I say stop, put the number you found in the chat box. So let's start finding the numbers now.
and stop. Okay, so now put in the chat box the number that you were able to locate. 21, 19, 17, 24, 20, yes. So it looks like most people got at least twice as many as they got. Now there's another example in the book and the one in the book, people tend to get three times better than uh, the first time. And so we did a lot better the second time, not because we were any smarter people in the room, but what was the major difference between the first and second attempt that allowed us to do so much better? Exactly, we knew what the pattern was. We knew how the information was organized, yes. And so that's what I tell students, that's what we have to, uh, to do. So we saw how the information was, was organized. And so I want students to know that's the goal in school. You need to know how the information in chapter three relates to the information in chapter one and be able to put these things together. And we, one of the things that I have learned, because I didn't know anything, well, I shouldn't say anything. I knew about the homework thing, but everything else that I do, I did not know for the first oh, 30 years of my career. Um, but then when I got to LSU and found out that it was possible to have these dramatic and significant increases, quick in increases in student performance. Then I started reading everything I could get my hands on that would give me more information about this. And one of the things I read, first things I read was how people learn. It's put out by the National Academy Press uh, now over 20 years ago. And um, it talks about a lot of learning principles that we knew up to that point. There's a second volume out now that, that's also great. But uh, so it talks about metacognition and some other things too. The second volume is how people learn too, uh, looking at learners' contexts and cultures. And so it has information more about culturally responsive teaching and those kinds of things. But we know a lot about learning now that we didn't know 30, 40 years ago. We know that active learning is much more lasting than passive learning. So if we can get students engaged in, in reflection questions and activities, then that kind of learning is gonna be lasting. We know that teaching students even the word metacognition is important so that they know that they have control over their own thinking. Okay, and then also the level at which learning occurs is important. And that's where Bloom's taxonomy comes in. And this is the form of Bloom's that I like to share with students. Um, I know that it's not hierarchical, um, but I like to have remembering as the base. So we go from remembering, uh, just recalling information to understanding, uh, being able to um, explain concepts in your own words. You could explain it, any concept to your 80 year old grandmother or your 80 year old nephew in words they understand, giving them examples and analogies from their own life. At applying, now you can use the information to solve problems, answer questions you've never seen before. At analyzing, you can break material down into its component parts. At evaluating, now you can see if one treatment plan is gonna be better than another, you can defend that choice. And at creating, you can come up with your own ideas, your own theories, your own information. And when I show this to students, that's when the light bulb goes on. They really get it. And oh, here's another uh, form of that where now, they're the verbs that are associated with each level that if you share that with students, then they'll be able to readily identify what level they're operating on. Uh, and when we teach it to students, they actually get it. And so when I show this to students and we can put the next uh, poll question up, after I show them Bloom's taxonomy, uh, I ask them to think back to secondary school and uh, let me know at that level, did they think that they uh, were operating, what, what level did they think they were operating mostly at in order to make A's and B's at that level? Okay, one, one, okay. Yeah, and you're absolutely right. That's usually what students say. Uh, so the next one is in college courses, because I like to give students this information after the first test or quiz. And so that's why I encourage us as faculty to give the first test or quiz very early because most students need a wake up call. So we can put the next uh, poll question up if you want to. Um, the students okay. need a wake up call before they are ready to hear this information because most of them think, I don't need this information, I'm fine. But after they've had that first test or quiz, then, and they haven't gotten the marks that they expected to get, then they know that they need to, uh, to do something differently. So if the poll is ready, we'll get it up. Okay, there it is, yeah. So um, what level do you think students said they needed to operate in college? 
pretty much looking like what students say. And I'm gonna encourage you when you share blooms with students to ask them these questions. And so uh, the big bump here was applying and analyzing, evaluating. And so you, you are similar to what students say, but almost nobody says remembering and understanding. Uh, they typically will go to applying, analyzing, evaluating, and usually it's higher than that. But now when I've talked, in, when I've talked to groups of students, and if a lot of them do say applying, then I'll say, well, do any of you have any term papers you have to write in for any of your courses or any projects you have to do? And they'll say, yeah. And then I ask, well, what level is that? And so put in the chat box for me, please. What level do you think it is if students have a project that they have to do at the end of a course, or if they have a term paper that they have to write, what level of, yeah, it's six. And this is what students tell me. They'll tell me six. And so, I, so, cause I want them to understand if they thought it was only three, that it's really six. And so let me X this out. And, um, and I'll show you the results of uh, when I did this and I was using clickers, I could capture the data. Um, this group said, remembering in high school and college, the big bump was at five. Um, and so usually students will go to five and six from ones and twos. And so that's the third piece of the puzzle. And so we tell them that the way to get yourself higher is this study cycle. And students love this thing. It's just a study system where the first step is to preview information before you go to class so that you will have that big picture of what's gonna happen in class. Then you have to go to class. And if you've done the previewing, you can actively participate in class. And then as soon after class as possible, review what happened in class. So you can start the information going from short-term memory to long-term memory. And if you're efficient, it only takes about 10 minutes to do the preview and review. So you've got to do more than that. And we show them how to do what we call focused study sessions uh, for about an hour, each of the steps in here. First set a goal, then study with focus and action, then take a break and then review what you've just studied and then see if you can do another one. And if you only have 10 minutes, you can do one in 10 minutes. Uh, set a goal for a minute, study for eight minutes. You don't have to take a break then, but then uh, review. And so uh, students love this because so many students say, well, I really just don't know how to study. I never had to study before. Nobody showed me how to study. Uh, and then the last uh, step is check your learning. See, can I teach the material? Can I work these problems without looking at a solution? And students love this. We used to call them intense study sessions, but we changed it to focused because some of the students said intense was too intense a word. So now we call them focused. But when this young lady was in school, we were calling them intense, but she said that they helped her the most. She got an A plus on three out of four for finals using that method. She said, it's important to use it every day before finals week, but it really benefits students during finals week when they have limited time. They've got so much they have to do in a limited amount of time because it's also kind of a time management strategy. And this was an instructor who um, used the information with a student who wasn't doing well. And she shared the PowerPoint with him and told him just to concentrate on Bloom's taxonomy and the study cycle. And he emailed her that he was applying himself, changed his study and planning habits. He scored 114 on the first and only graded homework, took the first uh, 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 exam on Wednesday, got 100%. And she said she used the idea that teaching is helpful to students. Uh, when she invited students to co-teach some of the lectures, they did a fantastic job adding much more content and real world experience. And she said it was a wonderful experience for her because she saw how students poured their passion and talent into the lecture. Um, this is a study and you can look this up, but these were um, chemistry faculty members who implemented a face-to-face -face class format based on the study cycle concept. And they did some other things too, but the success rate went from 50% to 75% uh, when they implemented these, uh, these interventions. Uh, there's an uh, article out that shows how it came out in 2020, how metacognition coupled with active learning re, uh, uh, results in a higher performance on cognitively demanding courses like general chemistry than does active learning alone. And in the next couple of minutes, I'll say just a bit about mindset. And this is Carol Dweck's work. So please put in the chat box, yes or no, if you're familiar with Carol Dweck's work on mindset. Okay, and uh, okay, and some of us are not. So very briefly, uh, Dweck and her group found that there were two different 
attitudes that people had about intelligence. They thought either, oh, and David Shank wrote a book after Dweck's book uh, that uses much of her work. But she found that most people think that either you have a certain amount of it, yes, with the critiques, and it's being critiqued now, and I agree with those, but I think the idea of mindset and helping students understand that they can grow their intelligence is very, very useful. So what she found is that most people uh, found, felt that either your intelligence was static, you um, have just a certain amount of it, and she calls that a fixed mindset. And the growth mindset, though, is you believe that you can develop your intelligence, you can make yourself smarter. Yes, most of the research doesn't replicate, Dominic. Yeah, and, and what I do is I'm looking at the difference that I see in students' attitudes, the, um, the strategies that students are willing to try. If I can convince them that their scores were not based on any lack of intelligence, or if they thought it was, they can improve their intelligence. And so uh, I, I understand it from both sides. And, and I can tell you, um, because in, in the book, there's a little bit about learning styles and people say, you know, learning styles, that, that's been, been debunked years ago. Uh, but I find that when I talk with students about learning style preferences, they will do things that are congruent with their preferences that they wouldn't do had they not known that. And so my bottom line is, is it likely to help students and is it not likely to hurt students? Okay, but that does not mean that framing is not important, just not as easy as Dweck's. Ah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, thank you, Dominic. I totally agree with that. And so when I describe it to students, I just want them to know that they can grow their intelligence. But yeah, exactly. Most students have a fixed uh, mindset uh, because we socialize students into having a fixed mindset. Um, now, the next question, what mindset about student in intelligence do you think most faculty have? Uh, one or two, okay, so I'm, I'm seeing a lot of ones, I'm seeing some twos, and I, of course it's mixed, it's, it's not, you know, all or nothing, but I think a lot of us as faculty do have a fixed mindset, and I talked about this at one conference, and people asked, well, what are, are you talking about STEM faculty, and uh, so uh, in that case, they said STEM faculty, more of them were uh, had a fixed mindset. And I had a fixed mindset. If you read the book, you'll see that I at once had a fixed mindset and did not think possible the kind of results that I've been showing you today. Here's a diagram that shows that if you have a fixed mindset, you avoid challenges, you give up easily when you get to obstacles, you see effort as useless, you think either you're smart enough to do it without trying or you're not smart enough to do it at all, so why spend any effort? Even criticism and the success of others People with a fixed mindset respond differently to than people with a growth mindset. So as a result, uh, they plateau very early. Whereas with a growth mindset, they embrace challenge, they persist in the face of setbacks. They know that effort is the path to mastery. They learn from criticism and they find lessons and inspiration when others succeed and they reach higher and higher levels of, of achievement. And just a couple of emails. Here's a student who had a very fixed mindset. He said he's not good at chemistry. He wanted me to tutor him. I spent not a nanosecond tutoring this guy. I only gave him the information we're give, I'm giving you today. These were his scores before our talk, the scores after. And in the email he sent me, he said, I uh, ended up earning an A in the course, but I started with a D. I think what I did different was make side notes in each chapter. And as I progressed onto the next chapter, I would refer to these notes. I would say that in chemistry, everything builds from the previous topic. Now, I think his instructor thought that by April 6th of a course that started in January, he had kind of gotten the idea that everything builds from the previous topic, but he did not. And there's a study now, I, I promise my, my host, I'm gonna be finished in three minutes, I promise. Um, but there is a study that links faculty attitudes on intelligence to student success in STEM with a large impact on minority student success. And what they found was that all students in the class of a professor with a growth mindset uh, did better. And it closed that achievement gap between minoritized students and majority students pretty much cut it in half. And so finally, um, I wanna end uh, giving you um, an example of a graduate student who uh, at LSU, we have eight cumulative exams a year where this tests stu students' cumulative knowledge in different areas of chemistry, and they have to pass six within the first two years or they're kicked out of the PhD program. 
Well, this poor guy, as you see, had only passed one his whole first year. So his advisor sent him to work with us at the Learning Center and the Writing Center. And I can tell you, nobody in chemistry thought that if he only passed one out of eight the first year, he was gonna pass five out of eight the second year. Well, he didn't pass five out of eight the second year. He passed five out of seven. And he passed the December exam with the highest score in the group. And this is he, Dr. Algernon Kelly. Take a good look at this guy. He's the only person I know on the planet who has a PhD in chemistry, but started every college course at the remedial level below first year. And um, when he left LSU, and now everywhere he goes, he teaches these strategies uh, to students. And I like to end with this series of three emails that a student sent him at his first institution, Xavier University. Um, and the student emailed him and said, you know, I really want to do well, but everything is just ending with a decent grade. He was pre-med, he was making C's. I was hoping you could mentor me and guide me down the path that will help me realize my true potential. And one week later, he says, hey, Dr. Kelly made an 84 on my chem exam compared to 56 on my first one using your method for two days. And then November 3rd, hey, Dr. Kelly, I've increased my bio exam grade from 76 to a 91.5. Ever since I started your study cycle program, my grades have significantly improved. I've honestly gained a sense of hope and confidence. And that's what we want our students to have, hope and confidence. And he says, my family and I are really grateful that you've taken the time to get me back on track. And we see his mood changes. Hello, Dr. Kelly. Hey, Dr. Kelly. Hey, Dr. Kelly. And especially in this virtual environment, I mean, so many students are having difficulty um, with uh, anxiety that this stuff really is, is very helpful. So finally, I'm gonna close by saying we can significantly increase student success, even in a pandemic, but we gotta teach our students how to learn. We've gotta provide engaging virtual sessions. We've gotta make the learning visible. We can't judge their potential on their initial performance and we can't let them do it either. We've gotta encourage them to persist even when they fail initially. We've gotta encourage them to use these metacognitive tools that are gonna result in deep and integrative learning. These are some additional resources. Thank you, thank you, thank you to my hosts and to my colleagues who have helped me to learn this information that I had no clue about. And here's the book for faculty. Here's the book for students. Thank you so much. And I will stop the share and turn it back over to my host. Thanks very much, Sonja. That's fantastic. What we wanted to do, if that's OK with everyone, is we have time for one or two questions now, but we're having a, a big question and answer session at the end. Oh, so we'd, right. really, we'd really love Pete to, to get a good discussion going then. But if people have a couple of questions now, that would be fantastic. But a okay. huge thank you to Sandra and a few a few virtual claps. It always seems so dry here. Um, but thanks very much um, for a fantastic talk there, Sandra. Thank you. Well, the question, and I'll do this in a minute so we can move on. Um, but what are the emotional responses from people when they come to the realization they use less than effective learning strategies for a long time uh, before appreciating? Uh, actually, they are very, very relieved. Um, the emotional responses, uh, I mean, some people have actually... Um, teared up. I mean, they, they've started crying because now this is the hope that they've been looking for. They thought themselves failures. And then they see, no, it wasn't that I'm personally a failure. I was just doing the wrong things. Uh, wide variety of employers or businesses not encourage or socialize a growth mindset. Yeah. And I, I do think that it's because a lot of professionals don't have a growth mindset because we can't believe that anybody can grow their intelligence because we think of ourselves as we are really smart people. Not everybody can be as smart as we are. So we hold on to this fixed mindset. So you're absolutely right. And then the other one, I, I saw one other question I was gonna address uh, briefly. Oh, uh, what do you think can have a bigger impact teaching university lecturers how to teach or teaching students how to learn? I think both are important, um, but I think that teaching students how to learn uh, will have a bigger impact. Because when I talk to faculty groups, uh, many times I'll ask, I'll say, you know, if, if Everybody on your campus heard this information uh, about how to teach better. What fraction of your faculty do you think would change the way they teach? And the answers range from about you know twenty percent to a high of fifty or sixty percent. So that means that if we teach faculty this, still one out of every two faculty members that a student will encounter are not using this. But if we teach students this, then they can use it in every class, no matter what the professor is doing. 
So thank you very much for the questions and I will turn it back over and we can continue and I can answer any others at the end. And thank you, thank you for the accolades. And I'm gonna say thank you. You're doing the hard work. You're out there in the trenches. I'm just sitting back in my study doing these sessions. I wanna thank you uh, for all that you're doing uh, on behalf of your students. Thanks, Sandra. I see we have a couple of questions, but I think it would be great if we keep those to start the discussion going this afternoon, if that's okay with everyone. So what, what we're planning to do now is um, move over to doing a presentation about um, some work we've been doing using the virtual learning environment to try and augment a development of, of metacognitive skills in students. So we'll just get set up sharing our screen. Carmel, are you good to go if I share my screen? Yes, please share. Great yes. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so for this part of the seminar, uh, we want to focus on how we designed and tested uh, different strategies to promote uh, metacognitive skill development um, and supported by our virtual learning environment. And in UCD, for us, that's Brightspace by, by D2L. So uh, Emma, Crystal and I came together as UCD fellows in teaching and academic development. And our overall aim uh, was to explore how our new VLE, which we adopted a few years ago now, could be leveraged to support more meaningful learning uh, among our students. Um, and we uh, embarked on a research project taking a pedagogical approach to uh, analyze different ways our students learn and different ways that we might support them through the VLE. Next slide. So I also wanted to mention there was a fourth member of our team. He, he's not here today, uh, James Matthews. Um, and also that you can see that we're from across the university, uh, different disciplines. Uh, James uh, was in the sports uh, science area. Crystal is in information and communication studies. Myself, I'm in the biomolecular and biomedical science area. And Emma uh, comes from the veterinary medicine school. So through the fellowship program then, we developed uh, shared aims. We wanted to develop 21st century skills, uh, the, the skills of critical thinking, knowledge application, uh, the adaptability among our students for lifelong learning. Uh, we also wanted to address the issue of surface learning and the poor linkage of concepts uh, across modules within a program. And, address the issue of just using the VLE as a repository and, and you know, how, how could we uh, enhance uh, the VLE experience for students to support uh, a deeper learning and overall promote a better student engagement through the, through the VLE. So we've heard now from Sandra some uh, very nice examples about how metacognition is key and the positive effects on some of our students. And that was very, very nice to see. And we started out with a, a focus on metacognition and its known effects on um, academic achievement, lifelong learning, skills and adaptability uh, going forward uh, in, in the workplace. So research has demonstrated clear links then between metacognitive skill development and the academic achievement and lifelong uh, learning of students. We consider two different aspects of, of metacognition, the knowledge of cognition um, and how we might support this. The next slide, please, Emma. And then the uh, recognition and regulation of cognition uh, among our students. Uh, so we considered uh, this definition of, of metacognitive skills and we looked at uh, aspects under knowledge of cognition and um, how we might recognize different approaches and strategies. And we also looked at the regulation of cognition and plan planning and monitoring, et cetera, uh, for our students. So in our research, then we're particularly asking the questions, uh, how best to use the online environment uh, to support metacognition skill development. And I'm going to hand over to Emma now, and she's going to explain how we developed our framework um, to apply uh, in the VLE. Thanks very much, Carmel. 
Hello, everyone. It's really nice to have you all here this afternoon. When we, when we approached this and we'd identified that we really wanted to aim to develop metacognitive skills, we knew we wanted to design interventions and set about looking at the literature there was to, to inform us what approaches had been taken. And as we reviewed the literature, we found a site that had fantastic resources, which is the Education Endowment Foundation. Um, this is a a charitable body in the UK that looks at generation of evidence summaries from the literature in secondary or K-12 education, but particularly not only generating those evidence summaries, but looking at practical ways of translating this into practice. They run a toolkit online and look at various different educational interventions. And interestingly, metacognition and self-regulation ranks as the second highest of the interventions they have saying that it's high impact for very low cost based on extensive evidence. In case you're wondering, the, one, the only one that ranks more highly is the provision of feedback, which I'd argue really comes under this heading. So they, they really found that it was a very powerful and, and educational intervention, and they developed uh, guidance documents to look at how the, the evidence trans, could be translated into practice and came up with seven key recommendations for teaching metacognitive skills and self-regulation in secondary education. Now, what we thought was that this really tied in very well with what we'd read on in the literature on tertiary education and felt that we could adapt this. So we started with this evidence base and took five of their recommendations because one, um, one recommendation was about upskilling staff and one was about the, the educational setting in the institution and that was really out with this project at that stage. If I take you through these, these recommendations were that it's necessary to explicitly teach metacognitive strategies um, that not only this, you need to follow through with that and model this type of thinking when you're teaching students, but when you're wanting them to work on tasks and they obviously need to actively be doing something in order to learn, you need to set a degree of a certain degree of complexity that actually allows them to put these skills into action. Ideally, have that building and complexity as they develop their skills. All along, you need to be promoting and developing metacognitive dialogue. So getting students to think about uh, having a dialogue with themselves around their learning, but ideally also a dialogue with their colleagues and you, with you in class around learning. And finally, explicitly teaching organization and management of learning and communicating this expectation to students is really key. Of this, which was fantastic, but what we wanted to do was think about how we could practice practically translate this into an applicable um, model. How would, could we could translate this into practice? And we were really interested by work that we'd, we'd come across um, by Oliver, which was looking at um, learning design sequences. And Oliver had designed these as a way of presenting educational interventions online and communicating to students by placing student, student activities central to what they were doing and then communicating to them where they could find resources and supports that would help them in this journey towards uh, achievement of their learning outcomes and really map out what was going on in the edu educational intervention. So we thought we could adapt these using these um, underpinning approaches from the Education Endowment Foundation. So this really was the basis of the metacognition design framework that we've developed and trialled. And I want to walk you through what we did. So we'd taken those um, five recommendations, which we called our five metacognitive pillars, and started mapping those using Oliver's technique. I've started with this because really central to the whole thing is the student learning activity or task, because that's what's going to progress them towards the learning outcomes. And we thought a, a, an authentic complex project that was something that was going to really interest them and drive them working towards achievement of those goals was going to be appropriate. And we scaffolded that task so it's in increased in, um, in complexity through the course of the, of the module. So this was designed around a module, but the same principle can be used for a program. Looking at the different pillars now, explicitly teaching metacognitive strategies, we needed to introduce metacognition exactly as Saundra's talked us through. We had to get that message across to students, why is it important, what's it doing, and give them guides so that they could start doing that with their learning. But we had to follow through and model this. So we're modeling this type of thinking in class. We're getting them to activate prior learning, exactly as Saundra said, with the, with the reading and linkages techniques. And we're scaffolding tasks to aid this process. 
So thinking all the time about op opportunities for dialogue in class or group dialogue, if they're providing feedback to each other or discussing comp their complex projects, working as groups. If we give them rubrics, then we communicate to them some sort of clarity about what we're expecting. And then finally, thinking about explicitly teaching and giving them the opportunity to plan themselves. We need to put them in the driving seat of knowing what they can expect and announcing what's coming up, giving them information about what to expect. Obviously, you look at this diagram and there are lots of different elements just to point out that this is for a blended scenario. So you can see online and face to face and we can move that and did have to move some of it entirely online at one point, but it's designed around blended learning. But we've developed this further now and added in um, our IC strategies for learning because we think it helps people understand this framework when they first come to it. So if we look at this now, we have strategies around introducing. So introducing metacognition, into introducing content in a structured way that's going to enable students in success. We then want to signpost exactly where they're heading so that they've got clarity around tasks and expectations and they can plan around that. Um, learning resources that enable them to start taking the reins and taking control of their own learning, but they need to be able to check in and evaluate how they're getting on by using various learning supports in place. So the take home message from this is you can see that there's a lot of colour across this because it maps broadly to those pillars and there's obviously areas of overlap. Well, some, some of these things are performing more than one function, but we think it's easier to understand as the IC approach. And this just gives you an example of how this can be put into practice by developing this further as we go into a, into a specific setting. We, what we say is we're developing a learning design sequence in a specific setting, and this shows an example for clinical neurology. Now, what I would say at this point is this looks quite busy because this is a 12-week module on one page, but we, can, we mapped it out in three-week sections for the students um, so that they could see where they were heading. But actually, I think more importantly for staff it allows staff to plan exactly how things are going to be delivered and which aspects are going to be uh, are going to be delivered and how so just now we've said all of this is about working with the virtual learning environment I think it's important to think how we think about this this um, mapping of interventions practically within the virtual learning environment and this is where we came up with the concept of thinking about the staff and student aspects to this journey. So the student really wants to know exactly where they're heading and the expectations for them right at the end of the module. So we have to signpost that well. As staff, that means we need to give them pre-designed exemplars and guidance, but also think about how we create clear structure. And both sides need to be reflecting on what's going on. So there are lots of different components to this, and it's very difficult to communicate in a very flat, linear way like this on a, on a screen, which is why we created the virtual learning environment for you to have, have a play around with when you get logged into the Brightspace environment, and we'll come on to that later. But this just gives you a taste of the types of tools that are out there in virtual learning environments. This is Brightspace, but a lot of these tools are in all the different virtual learning environments with different, different capacities. But we've got think, the capacity to help students by providing checklists and templates and quizzes. But from a staff perspective, we've got the, the ability to use particular elements that can personalise the learning, that can automate feedback and automate tasks to make it achievable that we can deliver feedback and get this interactive environment for students. So I, what I want to do is hand over to Carmel, who's going to talk us through our research on this topic, and then later we'll come back about more practical application of this model. Okay, so just two slides here to uh, summarise uh, some of our research to date. We have results from three parallel case studies uh, in veterinary uh, clinical neurology, the psychology of sport and in uh, social sciences. Uh, we used a mixed method approach uh, to measure uh, change uh, if there was any change in our students' metacognitive skills. And so our students completed um, a previously validated metacognition awareness uh, inventory. Um, and they also completed uh, a motivation for learning uh, questionnaire, which was available also, uh, had been previously validated. And we got our students to uh, complete uh, the questionnaires. And so students within a group 
volunteered uh, to partake in the study. And uh, so you can see a percentage of the class uh, in each case uh, participated and were asked to complete uh, these questionnaires uh, at the beginning of the semester uh, before the module commenced and then at the end of the, of the module. We also had a number of students um, attend uh, focus groups. So our results then uh, showed a significant impact on uh, student learning. Uh, and here we have some of the quantitative uh, data um, outlined. Um, so we're looking at an increase in metacognitive skills measured here as, as metacognitive knowledge and metacognitive regulation. Um, so we saw an increase in both of those parameters uh, with an effect size of uh, 0.49 and 0.64 respectively. Uh, students also showed more confidence in their learning uh, and a self-efficacy for learning. Um, and again, this was significant and uh, with an effect size of, of 0.4. So overall, this initial uh, study showed a nice uh, effect uh, in terms of impact on metacognitive uh, skill development. I'm going to hand over to Crystal now, where we're going to look uh, more closely at the IC aspect of uh, learning strategies. Thanks very much, Carmel. Um, so across our qualitative data points, including our reflective assessment, focus groups, um, and open survey questions, students responded positively about metacognitive approaches to learning, reporting that the interventions encouraged, encouraged them to plan, monitor, reflect upon their learning. So importantly, they felt that increased motivation to learn and described a reduction of uncertainty around learning tasks. Students spoke about their developing metacognitive learning strategies through what we have termed IC. So the IC strategies include introducing, signposting, enabling, and evaluating. We were delighted to see that students engaged throughout their learning with these strategies and then taking each of these points one by one we'd like to share more about these with you and what our students thought. So first introducing. Students found a clear structure and organization of learning in segments useful because it provided a pathway through content for them. For example, we organized content in weekly uh, sections or sometimes in blocks of multiple weeks uh, of learning. The structure provided a logical and also visible pathway through Brightspace. Students told us that they found the organization of Brightspace helped them divide content, content into digestible blocks of learning for themselves. And as one student noted, rather than focusing on absolutely everything, just focusing on one thing, learning it really, really well, and then moving on to the next. Through careful organization, we were able to introduce key concepts to students early in the learning process and to offer ways of progressing through that content throughout the module. Signposting is next. Signposting includes all of the tools and content that guide the student, that show the students where they have to go, just like a directional sign when you're driving in a car. Students told us that signposts help them keep on track as they completed complex tasks. So tools like exemplars and rubrics really helped show students where they were going. And one student has summed it up here for us. Rubrics are really, really handy because you got to learn a bit more, like you knew a bit more of what was actually being asked for. So our next step is enabling. We tried to ensure that we use tools in the VLE to support students along their pathway of learning. These tools motivated and facilitated self-regulation of learning and increased student confidence. One very popular tool was the checklist. And students told us the checklist was very self-motivating. You knew what you had to do. You literally just tick it off and it's kind of broken down into more manageable tasks. Definitely, it was very useful. So the last point there is evaluating. Checkpoints in learning and self-evaluation form key parts of metacognitive learning. These enable students to check in on their learning, for example, through peer feedback, quizzes, and reusable learning objects. Students found moments to self-evaluate useful in their learning, noting, for example, that quizzes were a really nice way of testing 
perfecting your knowledge of the module without being worried about stressing out for tests and stuff. Really helpful in terms of self-directing your learning. And then another student, and I think the video reflections or video feedback was really good because it meant that we had feedback on stuff that wasn't actually graded. I felt like I actually knew exactly what was expected from us on the module and from the feedback knew what I needed to do as well. So around this learning process, there were multiple opportunities for reflection. We encourage students to reflect at key points during their learning. Reflection deepened learning by helping students evaluate and plan for future learning. What, as our students told us, for example, reflection was good for making you actually think about learning. It made you think, actually think about the points that I was thinking over rather than just blindly going through the points of the lecture. So what did our stakeholders think? We spoke to stakeholders in UCD, including VPs for teaching and learning, deans, IT services, ed techs, as well as external examiners about our metacognitive approach. All of our stakeholders noted the power of a metacognitive approach, noting that metacognition can move us away from assessment driven engagement to holistic learning, that, that it fosters critical thinking and awareness of learning, that it helps students strategize and importantly provides a foundation for programmatic learning. And as one vice principal for teaching and learning noted, it's a very long quote, I'll let you just read it, but the key piece that, that she said was that it is potentially transformative then for students and how they engage, links hugely into their life outside and beyond the campus. So really important. And then next slide, takeaway projects, takeaways from the project. Wow, well, we, we learned that it's possible to have a clear positive impact on student learning and the development of metacognitive skills by changing your style of approach. Students recognized and valued this approach overall. We also found we had developed a valuable framework to harness the potential of the VLE to promote the development of metacognitive skills in students. And we also realized that no one size fits all. Um, we needed something adaptable, use of our, these, all of these elements to guide our approach in different contexts, that's essential. And where are we now? Well, we are now conducting further trials in different modules, math, science, and architecture at the moment. And um, we have completed a video case study and we're working on some small case studies as exemplars. And we're also in the process of developing workshops to support wider adoption. And we've started to establish a community of practice by locating metacognitive champions, people who are willing uh, to uh, and excited about trying out metacognition in their modules and finding out what it can do for their students. Considering this IC approach in, in uh, more detail, but particularly introducing the Brightspace Learning Center. And I'll show you in a second, but as I say, I really want to first of all, make a, a huge point of thanking D2L, um, the makers of Brightspace, because they've provided us with an amazing amount of support as we've gone through our project, but also in making this, um, this facility available as a learning space that you can access now. And as I say, over the coming um, few days and then in the future again. So this, when you log in um, with your logins, you'll land on this landing page and get a welcome note um, for landing you'll be able to see these little um, tiles with information about each of the units in this in this course um, and then when you move into the content there's a I show people because I know quite a few people might not be used to using Brightspace um, there's a welcome note from all of us there um, and then a table of content. So this table of content actually is organized lim um, linked around this seminar so it talks about the seminar uh, metacognition, our project, and now what we're into now, the metacognition design framework. But there's also a huge resource of um, section of resources for learning within the VLE with activities for you to perform and downloads for you to use in your own setting if you, if you have access to Brightspace yourself. But it certainly gives everybody the chance to trial that out. If you go through these sections, I'll just go into metacognition as an example. The first of the pages gives you an information sheet 
that then gives hyperlinks out to further further information on each of those. And we think this is a, a living way of bringing to life the metacognition design framework because it's difficult to envisage as a flat piece of piece of text without seeing how it actually translates into practice. So that's why we'd love you to try it out and get thinking about it in your setting. OK, so I'm now going to go back to sharing my talk. So this is where we left off. We were looking at the um, metacognition design framework and we're aware it's got lots of colour on it, but that all maps to these recommendations that are all evidence based. Um, and we've we've simplified the approach by framing it around the IC, which we've shown has linked into how the students um, re reflected on their learning experiences, having trialled this in our modules. We felt that really the next stage when, when using this and our experiences of, of trialing this with additional people working with us is that going from the metacognition design um, framework to design sequences, it's really helpful to have a workflow in mind. And this is what we've, we've put a copy of this in the learning resource and we can work through this now. In that as, as we approach the, um, the, the main focus as it would be in any educational setting when you're planning what you're to, going to deliver to the learner is thinking about what out, learning outcomes you want to achieve. And our focus is around developing a complex project and, and um, learning assignments centered around leave, um, achieving the learning outcome, then progressing through to introducing and how you might introduce uh, metacognition and think about really clearly structuring the learning journey for students. Then thinking about signposting opportunities, how you can make it really clear to them what that end result is and what's going to help them progress through to the um, required standard and make it very clear to them what the required standard is. How you're going to provide um, res resources that enable them in that, so some sort of provision for them to achieve that and opportunities for evaluating along the way and then reflecting. So as, as we're going to go through with them in detail, but the one thing I did want to stop and, and point out to people, because I think sometimes this is something that isn't immediately obvious to people as they come in, is that really we need to be thinking about blending. So we need to think about our opportunities for blending. The learning. So the key is to think about opportunities for blending. And the reason for that is, that it offers a, a, an increased chance to um, have exposure of learning activities to your students. So normally when you're just doing face-to-face -face learning, your opportunities to influence your students are limited to class time or when you're giving them homework or whatever, like Sandra spoke about. When you involve digital learning and the virtual learning um, environment and blend learning, you immediately increase that exposure time. So you can be giving them up, um, activities that promote the right sort of learner behaviors well beyond class time and also deliver little reminders to them to keep them on track and keep them motivated and engaged. Not only that, it does op offer opportunities to manage your own workload and make, make that achievable. We all know um, timely feedback is important, but it's not always as easy to deliver as we might like with large numbers. So all the way through this IC approach, I'd like to encourage us to be thinking about how we can get the virtual learning, uh, learning environment to work with us and help us achieve what we're trying to achieve. So I'm just going to take a very quick look through before we get started and discussing, just thinking about some of the opportunities that might be in the digital environment to help us with this, with this IC approach. So when we're thinking about our complex project and think we want to be thinking about active activities for students and we've got the ability to really use varied resources we've got some up there on, on as examples we can use group interaction we can use gradual release of materials and conditions of release so that we can really make things a bit more varied for students and gradually increase the complexity i am using just one of my examples here but i did um group work based around clinical cases and had huge amounts of clinical case material framed around the history re releasing and then the physical exam findings and neurological exam with video based material and then all the advanced imaging that went along with that the students got released gradually and learned how to act like clinicians before they went onto the clinic floor working through these cases and obviously they're very engaged then because it, it makes them feel more like their, their future selves as clinicians. So let's take a look at introducing and think about some um, things we might need to consider here. As Sandra's alluded to, and we 
demonstrated with the evidence base we drew on introducing metacognition and strategies is really important. We want to structure learning, but we also want to integrate this strategy use with the material. There's no point just saying, here, do this and, and have it just separated from what we're doing. We've got to think about ways of introducing things. So we can use varied resources, YouTube examples, everything to try and make things accessible and real to students so that they can see why and see why and how for them. We use clear structure and hyperlinks, gradual release, all of these sort of things to make it that students get the content in digestible chunks that are clearly labelled for them to progress through, rather than just wading into a huge soup of content that they can't find their way through. And our feedback has been that they do favour that approach. If we look at signposting, there are lots of things we can do to help be clear to students. Just announcements saying, look, we're doing this this week, you might want to focus on X, Y, and Z, can make all the difference to somebody that's overwhelmed, thinking this is huge, this, if they're presented with it all at once. We can use things within the virtual learning environment that personalize the approach and speak to the students. And if this does help, because we, when we're doing that with students, we're really thinking about um, personalizing materials to students can have more impact than you think because we've all re received emails from students when things have gone out in a personalized way that they've reacted to far more than if they were just uh, bland and, and untargeted. We can use guidance documents, exemplars and rubrics to really make it clear to students what the expectations are. If we think about um, resources that offer opportunities for students to plan, monitor and assess their learning, then we can start providing things in the, in the learning space like checklists to let them check in and plan exactly what's expected. We all like to have an achievable list to work through when we're planning things quizzes to help you test where you are in the programme or maybe reusable learning objects. And we've got some examples of those in our virtual learning environment. And then using release conditions and, and tools that allow groups to interact together can be really helpful because it breaks it up into, right, they've achieved this particular task, they're ready to receive the next bit of information. It stops it from overwhelming students delivering too much at once. Linked to this, we need the learning supports to allow them to evaluate. So this is really where feedback, feedback, feedback. But the, the, this is where the learning environment really comes into its own because you can automate some of these tasks. And whilst you might think, well, automated feedback is not going to be very helpful, we can all identify key, key areas students struggle with or that question that you always answer class multiple times over because it's a a really critical concept that they just don't get and, until they've really thought it through a few times. If you can create reusable learning objects or quizzes that center around that and give feedback on that um, immediately, then it's a really effective way of using your time and um, giving them the feedback they need immediately. We've also used feedback um, from staff directly and peer feedback in both audio, visual or written con um, form. So it just really gives a load of opportunities having the learning environment. And I should say that we've we've got some um, carefully put together ways of showing that to you. If you take time to log in and try these out um, either during this session or at the end of the session. But as Crystal said, all of this needs to be framed around reflection because feedback's no use if the students don't actually take this on board, think about their mindset and that they're not being graded as to who they are, but rather where in their learning they are and that they can progress. So we need to get them to be actively reflecting on their learning, thinking about how this translates into how they can improve, getting the dialogue around learning and dialogue around discussion of learning um, rife. So either within class or within discussion boards or with them doing peer review of each other. But we need to, they need teaching how to do this. It doesn't always come naturally to people. So you need to provide opportunities for that. So this comes back to just showing where that all links together. This, this sort of visual is really allowing for planning on a, on a time linked basis so that you can think like where in the module am I going to introduce this and in what sort of format. So we hope that the flow chart help the workflow helps people see that. 
The other thing to highlight is it is important to think about the student's perspective of what they're going to require and what's going to be your perspective and what you're able to do. And, and so there are two sides to this. And this also reminds me, this is a clip from a video a case study we've made that I'd encourage you to have a watch of because it talks through some of this learning journey in a bit more detail. And I think then we'll really communicate what we were trying to achieve. Thank you very much for attending. Um, the whole seminar, but thank you very much for listening to our talk. Uh, we've had help from so many people. In particular, we'd like to acknowledge the funding and support received from UCD Teaching and Learning and the Fellowship Board for under their undertaking of this project. Additionally, we'd like to thank the staff in UCD for their help and support. The D2L team has been incredibly helpful and we'd like to thank them as well. And for further information um, about you know, our project or our community of practice, you have our emails here, and I think you have them on your, your Eventbrite invitation. Um, our Twitter handle is here, feel free to, to tweet out about us. And of course, we have put together a fabulous Padlet here. So please, you know, dip into this if you wish to and see some of our resources. And don't forget to look at our Brightspace community um, area where you'll find loads and loads and loads of, of information and resources to help you. Thank you.